Hi, Jed from Cook Culture. So obviously I'm not in the kitchen today, uh, taking some time off with the family at the beach, but it hasn't stopped me from getting something really, really, really exciting done for you. And that is an in-depth conversation and factory tour with Peter Huntley, the owner and founder of Stargazer Cast Iron. So here's my piece of Stargazer that I got from Stargazer maybe six or eight months ago. I've completely fallen in love with what these guys are doing. As many people know, I'm a big, big fan and advocate of field cast iron, custom made cast iron cookware. They do a tremendous job. And I'm finding that Field and Stargazer are a little bit different. They both have a place in my kitchen. And I'm really, really excited to now be retailing and being the first retailer in North America of Stargazer cookware. So I'm pretty excited. I'm very thankful to Peter for allowing me to retail his product and trusting me in his brand. And as you'll find in this interview with him, he's obsessed over what he's doing and he's very proud and excited about what he's been able to make for you. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this. Uh, we do a deep dive and this is really, really exciting to see what is the difference between something that's just you know, kind of mass produced, so, so custom made like a lodge piece and what goes into making a piece like Stargazer. So I hope you enjoy. My name is Peter Huntley. I'm the founder and CEO of Stargazer Cast Iron out of Allentown, Pennsylvania. I started the company back in 2015. All right. Hey, Peter. Thanks so much for seeing me today. I really appreciate your time. Hey, Jed. Great to talk to you. Awesome. Thanks. So today we're going to get into your incredible brand and talk about what makes you know your tool, your your pieces of cookware so exceptional. Um, you know, full disclaimer, uh, I am a complete convert and an absolute fan of your product. So uh, I may be gushing just a little bit and uh, heavily biased in our conversation. I, uh, I don't think I'm going to be asking any uh, really hard and pointy questions because uh, I think just everything you're doing is, is, is amazing. But I'm, I'm excited to really understand how you've been able to, to do this and, and why I'm convinced uh, to be such a, a lover. So can you tell me how you, you, you started making cast iron in the first place? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for the kind words to start. Um, so like I said, I started the company back in 2015 and before that I had done uh, a range of things all in the all in the design field. Um, I'm trained as a, a designer and all of my my previous uh, career ventures have been related to design in one way or another. Uh, before I started Stargazer for three or four years, I worked for a um, a producer of ceramic and glassware. And that was my my introduction to the housewares industry. And I started to get a sense of um, communication with factories and sample approval and going to market and all these sort of, you know, the broad strokes of, of how this type of business is run. And uh, for my last, I would say, um, year or so with that company, I started cooking with cast iron at home. So I, like a lot of people my age, grew up cooking on stainless steel or on, you know, uh, Teflon coated aluminum or, or this type of thing. And um, I had a, a favorite a uh, cookbook um, that was always talking about this or that dish. You know, you got to cook this thing in cast iron because it gives it the special the cast iron magic as in this dish. And um, I went shopping for a cast iron skillet. I thought I got to see what what all the fuss is about. And I just wasn't wasn't that impressed with the cast iron that was around at the time. Um, I had done my research and everyone was talking about, oh, you got to get the vintage stuff. They don't make it like they used to, this and that. Uh, and I started getting really into the vintage stuff. I started collecting them, studying them, just kind of, you know, cooking with them and obsessing over them. Um, and surely thereafter, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm a designer and what if, what if I make my own skillet? And uh, that was probably, you know, sometime 2014. We spent about, uh, I say we, I spent about six months designing different versions of the skillet, talking to different you know, people who were knowledgeable about casting and how these specific types of things are made. And 
that's how that's how Stargazer came to be. And uh, at the end of 2015, I launched the, the brand, and uh, our Kickstarter went up at the beginning of 2016. And that was sort of the first time people started to hear about us, and uh, we started to get get some traction. And how did it become Stargazer? Stargazer. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of thought went into the name. It was a couple of things. So I wanted something that was personal, and I'm just a big astronomy buff. I love astronomy and physics and science, and um, I wanted something in that kind of kind of area. And we thought about how do you how do you attach a logo to a name in a way that how can you stamp it in the iron and have people recognize it and recognize the name. And I thought a star was, you know, just a classic, simple, memorable symbol. Um, so you got Stargazer and you got the star stamped right here in the top of the handle. And yeah, everyone Beautiful. knows where it came from. Beautiful. Awesome. That's cool. That's a cool story. So I, I assume that that the all the raw products and everything is coming from the States. Um, what does it mean to have an American-made product? Yeah, that was something that was really important to me. Um, there were a couple of things moving into this that, like I said, I worked in you know three or four years in that that ceramics and glass production, and it was all produced overseas as most products are today, and that was that was fine. That's the the reality of of that business. But um, cast iron has a unique um, place in American history, and I think a unique place. It's uh, uniquely American, for, for lack of a better a better term. And um, in my experience, and from what I had seen in other products, there's this. There had been this story of it used to be American made, and then at some point they started producing it overseas, and inevitably the quality would slip, and it would kind of look the same, but it wouldn't be the same. It would have the same name on it, but it would be sort of a they don't make them like they used to kind of version of it. Inevitably. Uh, when you when you outsource the supply chain that way, um, and I thought, you know, if there's if there's any product that should be American, it felt like cast iron um, was the one. And I, you know, I met with a number of foundries and, and talked about it. And it turns out it's it's still doable. You just have to have to invest in doing it that way. Um, so it's about quality and. For me, it's about you know some level of pride that I want to make it here and I want to have my hands on it and feel like we really made it. Um, and it's also about you know safety and um, environmental protections and all these types of things that I think, if you're making it in America, there are specific um, you know guidelines in place that that make sure that we're going to do it right. And I wanted to keep it keep it here if possible. And it's we've been successful that way. Yeah, well, good on you, because it, uh, it, it becomes a, a, it's such an easy thing for us at the point of sale, you know, when we're selling any product that is made in North America, you know, I love to include yep. Canada, um, but, uh, you know, it, it, people people feel very confident when they know that it's made yeah. here on, on our continent. So. so I've been using your pans for many months now, and I must say your interior finish is nothing like I've ever used. My 10 inch is probably the most consistently nonstick pan I own. How do you make this happen? Like, can you explain your magic? I can explain some of the magic. Um, so the surface finish is a lot of the, the sort of special thing about vintage cast iron, right? Because when people are talking about, they don't make them like they used to, they're they're mostly talking about surface finish. Because cast iron itself, I mean, the materials haven't changed. It's um, They're still pouring gray iron is the term for the, um, the specific alloy of cast iron that's used back in the day and still used today. We cast with gray iron. And you're talking about the same basic casting process, which is known as uh, green sand casting for Stargazer, um, as well as our, you know, some of our more premium competitors and, and some of the more budget friendly brands as well. They're mostly doing green sand casting, which is the traditional way of, of doing it. So it's really about what do you do after casting that makes the difference. It has to do, you know, the, the machining, whether you do machining at all, whether you're doing hand finishing. And I can walk you through some of the specifics of, of what we do here. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Um, but just, yeah, just to give you the broad strokes for for um, context about the machining process, um, it's it's a you know an additional production step that adds adds quite a bit to the cost. It's one of the big separators between the premium brands and the budget brands. And as far as the casting process go, the the green sand casting 
um, you have a mold that's made out of wet sand. And if you picture like when you, when you make a sand castle and you want the sand to be a little bit wet so it holds, holds its shape, it's the same idea. So you're taking what's called the master pattern. That's a, a skillet shaped, um, it's like a skillet mounted to a, a plate and you're pressing that into wet sand, a mixture of wet sand and clay. And when you take that pattern back out of it, you have a cavity now in the sand that's shaped like a skillet and you're pouring molten, uh, molten iron at about 20, 26 or 2800 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere up there. Yeah. Um, it's like, you know, hot lava into the into that cavity in the sand and then you're letting it cool and harden and then you shake the sand off and, and there you go. That's your your shape there. That's how you that's how you cast it in the traditional process. Like I said, that's how we do it and how a lot of our competitors do it. Um, so I'll walk you through those those posts uh, post casting and post machining steps, all the stuff that we do in house here. Um, that's some of it fairly unique to Stargazer and what, what gives us that very specific um, and and often uh, you know desirable surface finish that we have. All right, that'd be awesome. Great. Okay, so when the when the skillets arrive here from our machine shop, you can see the starting finish um, is very shiny and very smooth. And if you look close to this, you can see that the handles are what I would call the as cast finish. They're kind of, uh, they're, they're pretty rough. I mean, they're sandy. So if you picture the, those are the areas that released exactly as is from the mold. And the, the cooking surface and the whole interior surface is this almost looks like stainless steel smooth finish that's been cut by the machine. So what we're doing is a couple of things when we machine it, we're both controlling the weight by dialing in a very specific, very precise thickness of the material, which is how we get the weight where we want it. And we're also giving it the first sort of surface finish um, pass that we're, we're cutting through the really rough stuff and, and leaving this clean level starting point for us to do the rest of our treatment on. Cool. I'll actually pull up um, in it here. This is the, the freshly machined surface. Um, so our skillets are, are turned on a CNC lathe, which if you picture a record playing on a record player, it's a similar idea. The skillet is spinning and the cutting bit is stationary and it's cutting away that the surface of the cast material and revealing that finish underneath. Okay, so this is one of, this is your first process in your, in your floor? So they, they go to, um, from our foundry to a separate offsite, offsite machine shop. Um, where that first that first pass is taken, and this is how they're received at our finishing facility here, is right. with this, um, you know, machined, cleanly machined, but not final finishing. You'll see the the additional steps that come yeah, after yeah. this, but we're giving it the the final thickness, and that's really important because the machining is so much more precise than the casting process. Yeah, you can imagine if you're pouring molten iron into sand. There, you know, even with all the computer control that's available, you're only getting a certain level of of control over a process like that. Whereas machining, you can really dial it in uh, very precisely. Yeah. So the CNC machine that that takes the first big layer off of the interior of the pan, that's also weighing the pan at the same time. So they all show up to your factory or to your workworm floor at the same weight. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's actually the the first step of our internal inspection, or one of the first steps. So. Step one of inspection okay. is, is a visual inspection and we're just turning it in the light and we're looking for a couple different things. Um, we're looking at the quality of the casting itself and making sure it got a clean release from the mold and there's no sort of, um, you know, pits or, or other sorts of defects in the casting. And we're also looking at the machine surface and make sure we got a clean cut on it and there's no chatter or vibration in the machine or any sort of other swirling or artifacts from the machining process. You can see um, he's pressing on the skillets here to um, make sure there are no cracks in the material because if, if the skillet were to have cracked at any point in the process, you'd see the crack would open up as he puts pressure on it. So he's just doing a check and make sure it's it's solid all the way through. Okay. Um, we weigh every single, every single skillet and this is our, um, our first and kind of top level check of was the appropriate amount of material machined off and did we end up with our final target weight 
and is the that thickness where we want it because the thickness the reason that thickness is so important um it's a couple different things i mean the the how how long your pan takes to preheat how long it retains the heat all, all these cooking qualities yeah yeah trace sure. back to the thickness of the material um so we're weighing everyone and that's that's our first check of that um step two of our inspection process is we check the the thickness of the material along the rim and the reason we we check them at the rim like this is one it's it's most convenient obviously um but it's also that that's sort of the um so uh, it can be the least precise area of machining because we know that the bottom um which sits flat against the the machining fixture is very precise but then as you move up the sidewall any any variations or sort of um uh room within tolerances that happen will happen as it moves up the sidewall so we want to make sure if that rim is within spec and the weight is where we want it then we know that that that's um through and through all the way through it's going to be exactly where it needs to be as far as that thickness and the finish and making sure everything is, is uniform um our last step in the inspections is to check the flatness of the bottom um now this is something that um some uh manufacturers of cast iron will put what's called a heat ring on the bottom of their pans it's a sort of a raised lip around the edge it's actually it's a relic from the days of the the wood burning stoves it's not a um it's not a functional design piece anymore but it's something that some manufacturers still produce either as uh you know a nod to vintage skillets or because they're more likely leaving themselves a little wiggle room for bottom flatness because if you imagine you know as the iron is cooling in the mold as things are hardening they can sort of warp a little one way or another and and they've kind of given themselves a little padding what we're doing is we're keeping the bottom flat so that you're getting optimal contact on a modern flat top stove if that's what you have mm -hmm. because we want the the interface between the skillet and the cooktop to be you know as much contact as possible for maximum heat transfer we're keeping it totally smooth and we're just dialing in that bottom the curvature of the bottom to be you know the appropriate flatness exactly where it needs to be so we're using this gauge to check every one of them it's checking the difference between the center and the sides making sure it sits totally flat um so you can see this probe in the center is probing the center and what we want is actually not totally 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 flat you want a slight concave shape very slight so that you know it's not going to rock on that center it's going to be sitting at the edge and you also you leave yourself a little bit of room for as the material heats and deflects a little bit it's not going to start rocking as it heats up so that's what we're checking on all these skillets here so moving on to grinding uh if you picture like i was saying you've got these two halves of of a mold um the the mold is made out of sand and you've got this cavity pushed into the sand from the pattern well that's that's one half of the skillet and on the other side you're pushing a, another pattern or the other side of a pattern into another um section of sand and you're taking those two sand cavities and pushing them up against each other and now you've got a a cavity in the middle of a you know sort of a hollow in the middle of a sand block i guess is how you could picture it and as you could you could assume there's a seam where those two halves of the mold meet and we call that the parting line that's the area where the sand gets pushed together and what we're looking at now along the sides of the handle and along the rim and in some of the corners is the artifact left of that parting line because there's always a little bit of molten iron that seeps into the seam and you're left with this little bit of raised edge all along the perimeter wherever those those mold halves separate and so the next couple steps that we're going to we're going to go over are all uh, removing and smoothing out all of those parting lines so that you don't have any edges or or corners or sharp bits that are touching your hand when you use the product. So the grinding starts the first step of grinding that we do um is with the die grinder here and we're using a carbide bit to grind away um that raised edge on all of the inside surfaces. So if you picture inside the helper handle there where he's grinding now um and also inside the fork where he is right here and on the end of the handle where there's the hanging hole you have that same little bit of raised edge in all those areas 
So we're taking a pass and cutting away any sharp edges in there so that no matter where you put your hand, you find a smooth surface. And I'll give you one other uh, piece of info. If you saw him grinding on the bottom of the handle there, underneath the helper handle, that's actually where we stamp a date code during casting. So okay. um, both for traceability and also just because we think it's, it's fun to have it there. Um, on the day of casting, we stamp the, the full date code into the bottom of the handle. So that's your, your skillet's birthday. So if you look, you know, five, 10, a hundred years from now, you're yeah. wondering yeah. when was the skillet poured? Um, you've got the, da the, the date stamped in there. And uh, I think it's kind of, it's a fun thing because these skillets, you know, they last forever. So if you look at it, however many years down the road, um, sort of a, a piece of history there. Awesome. Uh, the next process is to remove that edge all along the, the outside perimeter. And for this, we're using a, a pretty narrow stationary belt grinder. And we're going all the way around the outside edges. You can see it, it throws some sparks when he hits into it because it's, uh, it's grinding away the, the iron there. Um, he's hitting the corners now, and then he'll follow the whole perimeter all around the handles, all around that outside radius there. And he's making sure that, again, every, every area is smooth to the touch and there's no, um, no raised edges or any other, you know, uh, bits, bits or pieces left over from that, that release from the mold. This is actually our most, um, technically difficult area. This is often, uh, the last place that, um, a new staff member will get trained. It's the, the hardest to get the hang of, and it's really, it's getting a feel for the weight and the pressure and how fast to move it. Because if you, you know, if you kind of um, stay in one spot too long, you'll you can gouge the material, and you got to really get a feel for it. So um, it, it usually takes guys a couple months before they really uh, get a feel for this machine. Yeah, sorry, I could see that. So the last step in grinding is uh, we take a pass with just a, a palm sander along the the bottom of the skillet to make sure if there's any sort of um, raised little edges anywhere, anything like that, that could scratch a stovetop. We're just giving it a quick once over and make sure that everything is, is smooth and level on the bottom. And what we're doing now in the cooking surface is getting everything totally level, um, which is sort of a secondary machining step. So if you picture when when the skillet is turned, when it's cut on that initial machine, that first pass that we take, it's turning from the outside towards the center and the machine lifts off at the center of the pan. And you have this sort of raised, um, sort of little blip in the center, you know, at the center of rotation. And we're going, we're going over that with a couple different, a couple different tools there to level it out and make sure everything is totally smooth and totally uniform all across the center. And that gets it ready for the, the final surface finish treatment that happens. So the next step of the process is a, a proprietary top secret uh, blasting process that we use here. Um, it's a very specialized process that we use specifically for this application that you can see it takes the finish from those uh, where you see the shine of the, the machine surface and you saw some of those sanding scratches. Now everything is this matte, sort of uh, bead blasted, fat and smooth. We call the finish micro textured because it's actually very finely uh, textured. And, and the reason for that is it preps it. Um, you're, you're introducing some texture for the seasoning ultimately, ultimately to hold on to. If we left it um, the same finish as how it came from the machine shop, which I know some other premium brands do, it looks really good, but um, we found that it doesn't hold seasoning very well at all. That that freshly machined surface, when it's shiny like that, um, the food doesn't stick and, and neither does the seasoning. So the seasoning kind of flakes away really easily. And by reintroducing some texture to it, which we do with this, this blasting process here, the seasoning holds a lot better. So you're saying this is a little bit of the secret sauce right here? This is definitely some of the secret sauce, yeah. Okay. And and how you're seeing it here, this is sort of the before and after. This is after we've applied that finish, and you can see mm -hmm. everything is now totally uniform, and um, and matte, and that you know we've knocked that shine down quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. 
So the last step in our surface finish treatment is, is my favorite machine and a lot of people's machines. It's, it's the vibratory tumbler. Um, you're seeing it now without the sound on, it makes a lot of racket, as you can imagine by looking at it. If you picture a washing machine full of rocks, that's pretty much what it sounds like and that's, that's pretty much what it is. Um, so what you're seeing tumbling through here are actually chunks of ceramic. And the ceramic, um, it's basically like a rock polisher that it's, it's an abrasion process that happens as everything is vibrating and, and knocking against each other. The, the chunks of ceramic are wearing down and they're also wearing away the skillets. Um, and they're going you know, into all the nooks and crannies and sliding along the surface. And um, they're rounding over some of the sharp corners and also smoothing out any, you know, any marks from grinding or um, you know, any other inconsistencies. Everything is getting sort of that final, uh, making it uniform. And, and also smoothing because I, up till this point, we haven't done much to, to the handles that um, the last time you saw them, they were that as cast finish that was still kind of sandy. This tumbling is knocking those down and getting those nice and smooth to the touch as well. How long would a pan stay in here for? Um, we run, it, it depends a lot on the type of ceramic you use. It could be anywhere from um, 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the size and type of, of ceramic being used. We're running a, a fairly aggressive type of ceramic here, so it's on the shorter end of that cycle. And as you can see, this is a this is a wet process. It's sort of like wet sanding that's done when you um, you know when you paint something. You can see there's a, a trickle of water down the back to keep everything lubricated and to keep the the sediment that's coming off cycling through. Very cool. So as you can imagine, coming out of the tumbler, there's a fair amount of. Um, just you know, sediment and uh, ceramic residue that's that's left on the pans from that process. So we're going through and actually individually, you know, washing each skillet, um, making sure we get we get all the the residue and and whatever else off of the pan and get it prepped for for the final coating. Um, here we're just using a, a simple green soap, which is food safe and biodegradable, and um, you know, ultimately safe safe for the cookware and. Uh, He's going through and scrubbing and blowing them out and drying them out. And they'll go from, from this washing area over to the, the seasoning area where they can start getting coated. So once they're done with the washing, they'll, they'll blow them dry and then they'll um, load them into these ovens that are at around 200 or 225 degrees. It's a pretty low temperature just to dry them out and, and preheat them and get them ready to take the coating. Now this is the start of our seasoning process. So once the skillets are warmed up, they'll come over to this oil spray booth. And this is another uh, uh, stargazer specific tool that we have here. We actually built this booth specifically for this. Um, you can see the filters in the back are, are pulling out overspray. And each of the skillets is getting um, just very lightly misted with our vegetable oil blend. Um, so if you're seeing these two hoses in the foreground, you've got a yellow one and a blue one. One of those is charged with pressed air and the other is feeding uh, the vegetable oil blend up the tube. And it's getting misted on in a very you know, light, even coat. And then he's using that, that blow gun on the side to blow off any excess oil. Um, each of our skillets is seasoned two coats um, by hand and you know it's applied one cone at a time by hand, it's a fairly labor intensive process, but we think doing it by hand like this is really the only way um, to get it really thin and really uniform because for the season to develop properly, it's gotta go on in multiple coats and very thin coats. Cause if you try to glob it on all at once, it's just gonna come chipping off. It's gonna you know peel away like a thick coat of paint. And what's your baking temperature and time? Um, so we're using convection ovens, which okay. means we can shorten the time quite a bit. Um, we do 40 minute cycles at 475 degrees. But if you were doing it at home, it's probably safer to do like closer to an hour and make sure, you know, depending how long your oven takes to preheat and that type of thing. We're using, uh, yeah, like I said, commercial convection ovens that heat up um, hotter, faster that we can we can shorten the time. Okay. So here we are unloading the skillets after seasoning. And you see now they went in that sort of silvery gray, stainless steel looking looking color. And when they come out after two coats, they're this dark, 
the dark copper brown um and that that will the color will continue to develop and change over time as the skillets get continue to get used and more seasoning is added and as they get heated over you know multiple cooking cycles you'll see that that, that color will continue to darken and, and they're getting would you mind sharing your uh, your mixture your your vegetable mixture vegetable no i don't mind at all we're, we're using a blend of um, canola, grapeseed, and sunflower oil. Okay. And uh, the reason for those is that they're all high temperature oils. The sort of um, prevailing uh, wisdom on this is that the, the high temperature, uh, high smoke point oils yield a, a more durable coating. I've tested um, a few different oils in-house. I haven't found a huge difference between them. Honestly, I think the most important thing is that, like I said, you're applying it in multiple very thin coats. That's really the secret is to go on really thin and, and that you're heating it hot enough and long enough for the oil to fully polymerize. Yeah. Um, so polymerize is just, it's just a fancy term for to go from liquid to solid. So if the skillet comes out and it's still shiny and greasy looking, it hasn't been in there hot enough or long enough. Awesome. And if anybody that's watching this wants more information on that, you can check out my video on where I spoke to a polymer scientist from the University of British Columbia on exactly the science behind seasoning cast iron cookware. You can see here, once they've come out of the ovens, this is the, the final finish on them. And you can see um, the last time you saw them when they had that blasted uh, micro textured sort of matte finish. Here you can see a little bit of, if you turn it in the light, it's almost like a marbled kind of quality where you're seeing some lighter areas and some darker areas. And what you're seeing there is is the tumbler. It gives it sort of a stonewashed kind of finish. Okay, and, yeah, I was wondering why that, that you know, I, could, I I love the the color and the texture of a Stargazer pan when it's brand new. And I was wondering why why it looks like that. Yeah, and it's, it's a combination of those two processes because if we put it, you know, straight after grinding right into the tumblers, you would see some of that kind of marbling, but it would be a lot shinier and um, so we're blasting it, then tumbling it, and you're getting this um, mat, but uh, it's sort of somewhere in between. I mean, the, the thing that I, I, I've used in the past, I call it the Goldilocks zone of the surface finish, because you're, you're making it smoother when you machine it, but then you, um, you blast it, and you're making it rougher again, and then you tumble, and you're making it smoother again, and you're sort of, each time you're getting, uh, with each process, you're getting closer and closer to that, like, exact that happy medium, right? Where it's it's holding the seasoning, but it's still releasing the food and it's gotta be smooth, but not too smooth. And and that's the reason for, for all the steps involved. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that, you know, for the first, I'd say uh, two years of, of Stargazer being in production, it was dialing that in, listening to customer feedback, tweaking the steps, tweaking the tumbling time, tweaking the whatever, and getting it to, to that really optimal optimal place. I, I personally, I also really enjoy the shape of the pan. I grew up using a, a French splayed uh, frying pan. And uh, so I, you know, I, I didn't actually use an American skillet uh, until I was well into my teens. Uh, all we yeah. had was splayed pans. And I, I love using cast iron. I'm a, I'm a big cast iron fan. I've actually even given up using, you know, two and a half millimeter French copper cookware to use cast iron because I love it so much. I think it's just so unique in how it works. But using your splayed pan that the shape of it, it it definitely makes me comfortable it's something i grew up with i'm very familiar with using a pan like that and your non stay sorry your 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 uh, stay cool handle i end up using your pans very much like i use my you know iron handled copper cookware growing up you know i move the pan a lot i'm really active with the pan i don't right. just set it and work work it with a skillet or or sorry with a spatula or the whatever i, I i'm very much moving that pan around a lot yeah, that's definitely something that um, in the development process, and you'll see like the flared rim, for example, as opposed to the, the pour spouts that you traditionally see on cast iron. And like you mentioned, the fork handle, those are things that, um, you know, when I started designing the skillet and talking to the foundries and talked about what we could do and, uh, and this type of thing, um, it was a real opportunity to, to reinvent the wheel here to some extent and um, uh, yeah, update some of these features that, that really haven't changed in a hundred years. Um, and, and our flared rim, just one example is, is something that felt very, uh, logical and like, like we've seen elsewhere and we know it performs well. It just hadn't, it hadn't shown up in cast iron yet. And we were, 
um, we were excited to bring some of those those modern modern updates to a, a classic product. Awesome. Well, you should be super proud of it because you know I, I I've now used a lot of different types of high end cast iron, and you know your pan is is so unique and and sits well at the top of of all those other brands because of of how, the shape of it and and that amazing finish. Right. There's just the combination of what you've got going on is is spectacular. So congratulations. Yeah, thanks on very that. much. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting. You know, I I as you know I. Cook culture uh, is being a field dealer for for a while now, and yeah. you know uh, we we sell a lot of field, and Stargazer is now going to come into cook culture, and uh, you know I'm very proud and very thankful to you for cook culture being the first North American retailer uh, of Stargazer, um, but it's going to go on the shelf beside field, and you know I think that there's a, a really good combination there. They're they're two very very different pans. You know I, it's hard. You know customers ask me often because they're like, oh, what's better, this or that? And when it comes to field and or or a traditional high end, I, you know not just field, but you know traditional high end and your pan, I think they both have place in somebody's kitchen. I, I say to people, hey, you know I think you can actually do a lot of different things with both of the pans. So I'm not saying buy one, I'm saying buy two. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, at, at a certain point, um, it's really just it's about preference and about what the application is. I mean, I've heard people say they like, oh, I like the longer handle when I'm cooking over an open flame because of the, you know, I don't have to get my hand so close to the flame or, yeah. um, you know, I like the a smaller type of skillet if it's going in the oven or the, this or that type of thing. You know, people have their own uh, different sure. use case for different things and, and just different taste. You know, some people are attracted to a more traditional looking skillet and uh, some people really appreciate the some of the, the modern updates and um, and things that we've incorporated into our design. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, what's fair, I think, for people, you know, full to full disclosure too, you know, I have a lot of customers that their biggest beef is that cast iron is heavy. And, you know, for, from my perspective, Stargazer is not that pan, you know, it's, it's not for that person. It's like, oh, I'm trying to find a cast iron but light. You know, I love the weight of Stargazer. I think the heaviness of it is really adds to the quality. You know, I, I yeah. advocate in many videos and to customers all the time, weight is quality. You want the number one gauge of buying cookware? Buy heavy. <laughs> yeah. Simple. I, you yeah, know, I'm, you, I'm glad you brought that up because that's something, you know, I, I was talking earlier about dialing in that exact thickness. And that's really, um, uh, it's important that people understand that that thickness um you know that's that's a functional thing that's a functional part of of the way the pan works and there are lighter pans on the market but we have our machining specifically dialed in at this thickness because we believe it functions the best yeah. um you know when you when you go thinner than that it doesn't retain heat the same way and it doesn't heat as evenly and sure we could machine off more material and there are some people that would get excited about oh it feels so light in the hand but it's it's really not going to cook the same way and um and and the same on the other side if it's if it's too thick well then you don't have as much control over the heat right because um when you dial back the heat it's it's still retaining that heat and it, it can be harder to control a very a very thick very heavy so again there's there's a goldilocks zone there's a happy medium and we're trying to dial in what we believe to be that optimal weight and optimal thickness and then and then just really holding that line that we're just checking and double checking and making sure every skillet is exactly there okay so this is the last stop in the line here is is packaging um the skillets come into this area on the cart once everything's cooled off they get boxed up so this packaging um is actually made just down the road from us and there's a uh, a packaging facility where they use 100 percent recycled paper so we're really happy about that and you know any way that we can uh reduce our footprint, we do it. Um, in each box there, you could see it for a second. He's putting a little a little pamphlet in there with the uh, use and care tips and um, some other good info for anyone who's new to cast iron. And right there on the front of the box, made in USA. And um, yeah, I just wanna stress again that literally every part of this process from the, the packaging to you know the material, the iron itself, um, most of the equipment we use in the process, I think all of the, the machinery we use is American made. I mean, we've really um, done everything we can to keep it, to keep the supply chain domestic. And uh, I'm really proud of that. That's great. So you, you don't think there's any Canadian iron that got snuck in there somewhere? 
There may be a little, Jed. I can't <laughs> promise. Honestly, we'd be glad to have I it. hope so. I hope tell so. You that. <laughs> that's great. Hopefully you got it free trade. Yeah. Um, all right, then. That's that's great. I, you know, thanks so much for showing me the uh, the, the process there. That uh, it, it's really neat to see the visual. You know, from from our side, you know, we're always trying to help the customers get an idea of what why it's so unique. You know, we, we also I said you know we we sell field, but we also sell lodge, right? Lodge the most known brand maybe in the world when it comes to cast iron and. You know, I have more and more customers that just, they pick them up and they just, there's no love, right? You know, they understand that it's a utilitarian piece, but you know, they now, they grab a field piece and they, you know, I've shown many, many, many customers my own personal piece of Stargazer and you know, you can see them emotionally get attached to it as soon as their hand touches the handle, right? They, they, they're looking for that. They come in and grab Lodge because they're looking for cast iron and there's nothing there, right? It's, it's, it's really just going to the corner store and buying, you know, something, you know, we're here, you're into a boutique buying a handmade product. And it really is that, and you can see that in the video. So I appreciate you showing me. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, that's, that's definitely one of the big, um, uh, you know, separating factors there is this is just the amount of time that, that hands are on this and, and, you know, the attention to detail and the number of steps involved. And that's, that's one of the things that really sets us apart is, um, yeah, how much how much labor really goes into every single skillet? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So thanks for showing me your amazing hands. I'm excited and honored to be the first North American retailer of Stargazer cast iron. I understand that you are a fellow vegan. I choose this lifestyle for my personal health reasons, but I am not convinced that someone must eat plants to be the healthiest human. I think an abundance of fruit, veg, and whole food is key to health, but my focus on cast iron is the health of our planet. I also choose veganism to try to do my part to improve the health of our planet. How do you see the choice of cast iron making a difference in our environment? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, so I am a vegan. You're right. I've been um, uh, maybe about 10 years or so um, down this path. And, and for me, from the beginning, it's, it's always been about the environment. I mean, it was the, the first thing that turned me on to this diet was, was learning about um, deforestation and, uh, you know, habitat loss and, and, uh, of course, climate change and all these, these bigger concerns that had to do with the agriculture system. And, um, that's a lot of what attracts me to cast iron too. I mean, cast iron is, is special for a couple reasons. Um, one is of course that it, it'll outlast you, that you're not gonna, you're not gonna have to keep buying pans in your lifetime. And, and the pan that you buy now isn't going to be in, uh, you know, in a landfill in five years. Um, and, and the other thing is that the, the recyclability of the material is, I mean, it's, uh, it's basically infinitely recyclable is, is how I would describe it. I mean, you can, you can take iron or any other, you know, ferric material, you can take steel or anything and you can melt it again and again, and you can cast it into any shape. And if it breaks, if it, whatever, if it rusts, it, it really, it doesn't matter. It can keep being melted and keep being poured as opposed to like, um, you know, uh, uh, some paper and plastics and certain things can be recycled, but they sort of degrade over time. And an iron just, it doesn't do that. You can keep melting and keep pouring. And, and the iron that we're using has already been recycled maybe multiple times. Um, you know, who knows how long this, this particular batch of iron has even been around. And um, we turn it into skillets that'll last forever. And I'm really, uh, I'm proud of that. And it's something that, you know, any way that we can reduce our environmental footprint, the product itself speaks to that. And I think the rest of our process, we're very, we're very mindful of that. Awesome. That's fantastic. Well, it gives me a lot of confidence to, to hear that. And I, you know, I see that in your process. So I, I really appreciate what you're doing. Uh, Thank you. Why do you believe that someone should invest in a, in a stargazer pan versus another high end skillet? So I'd say Stargazer is unique in its design. I mean, even among other premium brands, there are a lot of um, uh, features and, and things that we've introduced into this skillet that you just don't see elsewhere. Um, things like like I called out are, are totally smooth bottom, which we believe is optimal for anyone with a more modern stovetop. Um, things like our forked handle that, that stays cooler and our, our flared rim. Um, instead of the pour spouts, we think is another improvement, the large helper handle, all these things are our design. And, and I think that that's important, but really 
Um, if you're looking at Stargazer side by side with even other premium brands, I think you'll find that the handwork and the attention to detail is really, it's present here in a way that it's um, not necessarily present in other companies. And uh, I won't name names, but I think that we go, we go above and beyond and I, I think it shows. Okay, yeah, no, I, I, it's hard for me not to agree with you. So it, this may seem like a funny question after what you just answered about talking about premium to premium, but you know, we get a lot of customers that are like, hey, you know, I've got you know, this pan that I got for 30 bucks and I got this pan that I bought for 45 bucks and you know, I, I, Lodge works really well for me. Why would I wanna spend money on a Stargazer pan? Sure, and you know, Lodge and, and other um, skillets in that price point, it's, I can't argue with the value you get for that. I mean, if you're going to spend 20 bucks and it's still cast iron and it still lasts forever and, um, and that's fine. There's, there's a market for that. But I think at the end of the day, when you're looking at the surface finish being the main separating factor, if you're going to buy something that is machine smooth and American made, um, there's just no way for that to be done at that price point. And you're just, you're never going to get that same performance out of a 20 or $30 skillet. And people will say, well, yeah, after you, you know, use it for a few years and break it in or this or that. And yeah, maybe, um, maybe you'll get some of the way there, but I think, uh, our surface finish kind of speaks for itself in terms of out of the box performance and, and also lasting performance that as you cook with it, it's only going to improve and that that investment, uh, you know, that's a lasting investment. And, and, and that handle, like, really. and that handle <laughs> just, there's no comparison. Right. All right. That's, that's fantastic, Peter. Well, I really appreciate you showing me around. I, I hope that uh, one of these days, one of these years, I can make myself physically present in your facility and actually get a, a, a tour face to face. Uh, Absolutely. You know, as this all starts to lift up, uh, you know, people have, a lot of people have moved to cast in the pandemic. It's been maybe one of those tiny little silver linings of the pandemic that more and more people have been introduced to it. But I don't think that's yeah. going anywhere. I think the people that have been introduced to it have all of a sudden seen what their world can be like. You know, mm -hmm. people like you and I are, I guess, a little bit unique that we really, really geek out on this stuff. But I, I think there's a lot of people out there that, you know, can easily just step away from their Teflon now that they're maybe at the end of the life with it and they're looking for an alternative. And, you know, yeah. I think your product is a, is a tremendous, a tremendous, you know, second choice uh, to, to, to Teflon. You know, like you've got to move into something that is sustainable. And what you're doing is giving somebody a high-end option for something that will last in the rest of their life. So, you know, kudos yeah. to you. I appreciate the kind words. You have you have an open invitation to visit Allentown anytime. Love um, it. Yeah, and people can find cast iron like like I did. And, you know, I, I went through my first set of Teflon pans that wore out after a couple of years. And um, I found cast iron. I haven't looked back. And I hope there are more... Uh, more people and more younger people that can kind of rediscover it because it's been um, it's been unfortunately lost in the generations and it has. Well, I think it's coming back. I I, I produced yeah. a video a couple of weeks ago that people can go back and watch. It's an explanation in the in my industry in housewares industry about how a lot of our large companies in my industry have not been super clear with us. They haven't been totally forthright on what the materials are made of and the longevity of them and, and what goes on because a lot of companies just as it is they're trying to make things to sell and the more things yeah. that wear out the more things they sell and that's just the reality of it and if people go into it purchasing a pan realizing that there are companies that are actually trying to take advantage of that that they could maybe step away and make a choice for one time instead of 10 15 20 times in their life um, right. The opportunity is right there in front of them, and we just have to, you know, make that choice and help people get there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that that's fantastic. Okay, well, thanks so much for your time today, and uh, I really look forward to having your pans on our shelf at Cook Culture really soon. Uh, I couldn't be more excited. So thanks to you so much to you. Yeah, thank you. All right, Peter. Take care.